Well, for, first and foremost, I want to thank 5G Americas to give me the opportunity to participate in this uh, wireless technology summit. I'm going to be talking about the underlying infrastructure required for Curacao to benefit from 5G. Of course, all of us know that this is the new development in mobile industry and that it brings a lot of innovation and a lot of advancements with it and a lot of possibility to build economies. But there are requirements that we will have to meet if we really want to benefit from this development. When we're looking at infrastructure and the ways that we can maximize the possible value propositions that come from the 5G development, it is important to realize that the underlying electronic communication infrastructure is the one that is going to support this development, especially when you're living on an island. And all aspects of the infrastructure is important from the local infrastructure, meaning fixed line infrastructure, mobile infrastructure, fixed wireless infrastructure, the additional network elements that will enable us to connect, being the data centers, the internet exchanges, the international connectivity, um, being the subsea cables, considering the fact that we're on the island, on a island, um, subsea cables are prerequisite to be connected to the rest of the world. If this infrastructure is not in place, it would limit the possibilities and the cap capabilities that 5G brings with it. In the case of Curacao, we can say that we have a competitive electronic communication sector. Curacao has two mobile operators both of which are currently providing 5G services. Curacao has two fixed network operators providing fiber to the home and HFC connectivity with speeds of download up to 500 megabits per second and upload 30 megabits per second at prices that re reach a maximum of 64 US dollars per month. Government has most recently licensed two new mobile carriers that have the obligation to build 5G networks in the next coming two years. In addition to this, the government has also licensed a fixed line operator that has the mandate to build an open access fiber to the home infrastructure and we have also licensed an international carrier in order to make sure that the competitive environment is maintained moving forward. On Curacao, we can also boast that we have four data, data centers, one of which is a tier four data center. Tier four certified by Optime Institute. This means that this data center has an uptime of 99.995%, meaning that the max outage time per year is two hours, which has never happened up until today. The data center is also ISO 27001 certified. It's currently in the process of getting licensed as one of the first data centers in the region to have the EU data center GDPR certification. The EU, based on the most recent directive on critical infrastructure, has brought out a document indicating how critical infrastructures need to be protected against cyber security attacks in the document called NIS2. Currently, there is a proof of concept running that will help the development of the technical requirements for the certification. So this would also be a pro for the whole infrastructure on the island. There are seven subsea cables connecting Curacao with the rest of the world. 
We have two landing stations and we have an internet exchange that's among the biggest in the region. So when you look at all of this infrastructural components, you can basically come to the conclusion that there should be no reason why Curacao, its government and its people should be concerned with what and how they're going to deal with the 5G um, developments and how we are going to make use or benefit from all of the pros that comes with the development of 5G networks on the island. In addition to all of this, Curacao currently also has a mobile penetration that is over 100% and a fixed line penetration that is around 90% and fiber connectivity every day increasing more and more. So you would think we are in a good position to move forward. Just to give you everything that I just indicated just now in a uh, visual, I have here everything we already indicated, the mobile networks, the fixed line networks being fiber to the home and HFC, the data centers, the internet exchanges, the landing stations, and the subsea cables. So we are in a good position. That would be the general conclusion. But that isn't the general conclusion. Why isn't this so? Because one of the most important aspects of the infrastructure required to use the 5G networks is the subsea cables. One of the major challenges at the moment is the fact that the subsea cables are basically controlled by one operator. And secondly, is that from a Caribbean perspective, the pricing, the latency, the bandwidth that we are purchasing or we are able to purchase is a limiting factor that would prevent us from basically maximizing the value proposition that 5G brings with it. The way that we need to deal with this is one of the things that nobody normally wants to hear is regulation. It will be difficult, but it will be required. When we look at the developments today, we can see that when it comes to the local aspects of infrastructure, we have regulation in place. We regulate the quality of service of all of the infrastructure that is on island. And here I mentioned just a couple of them, like quality of service and also the fact that regulators are in the position to deal with dispute resolutions between with disputes between different operators, which is called dispute resolution, um, resolutions. Of course, there are many other as aspects that we need to take into consideration, but I'll leave this, these ones aside for today. Why? Because the most important parts are the ones that are connecting us or limiting our possibility to connect to the max of our capabilities with the rest of the world. We need to be able to get cost-effective IP transit connectivity. We need to be able to get cost-effective low latency when we're connecting to the rest of the world and cost-effective bandwidth pricing. We need to be able to guarantee that the quality of service of our upstream IP connectivity is at the max and that we are not being connected to the most low-level upstream ISPs. And there must be IP peering um, regulation because that would enable the connection between the different operators on the island, facilitating the transport of information from one end of the island to the next, regardless of on which infrastructure or on which operator um, the, in the sessions start. And when we look at the broader Caribbean, that means that if we are 
using all of these elements when we're talking about peering and our internet exchanges, we can keep our local traffic local, which would also help with the cost of creating the infrastructure to make maximum use of the 5G infrastructure. Keeping that in mind, let's look at the following slide. The following slide shows us that the Caribbean is very well connected. So it's not a question of we don't have enough subsea cables that connects us to the rest of the world, but it's about because we have smaller economies of scales and because operators are basically trying to get a return on their investment in a shorter time span, this is limiting the way that we are participating in this digital economy. As I indicated in previous slides, Curacao has seven subsea cable connect connecting it with the rest of the world, which would mean that in most cases, there are there is competition. And because there is competition, you will have better pricing. And because you have better pricing, there will be a bigger uptake of connectivity. There will be more use cases. But in this particular case, this is not happening. The next slide shows us a picture of what the rest of the world is paying for IP transit and what we are paying in the region. As you can see from this slide, in Miami, you are able to purchase IP transit at $25 cents per megabit once you're buying a 10 gig E connection. The highest price in our region, if you're looking at the Americas, is $4 per megabit when you're buying a 10 gig E connection. But in the Caribbean, in Curacao, for instance, we currently are paying $8 per megabit when you purchase a 10 gig E, but from conversations with my colleagues on other islands, I know that some of us are paying up to $20. And of course, this is prohibitive and will prevent us to basically use the benefits or get the benefits of 5G to the max because these pricings will limit how we are connected to the rest of the world. Now, pricing isn't everything. It's just one of the challenges that we need to overcome. The next slide shows the main cloud service providers globally. And now we're really getting into the operational aspects of what we're dealing with here. All of the services that we're using are currently moving to go cloud-based. These operators are mostly located in the developed countries. Of course, because there is a bigger economy of scale and there is where there is more activity taking place. But this is also one of the reasons why we need to look at how we bring these operators, how we bring certain aspects of these cloud service provider closer to us. One of the aspects that I have indicated in previous slides is latency. The further we are away from these data centers or these edge cloud providers, the more challenging it would be to make use of services cloud-based services that are time sensitive because of latency aspects. But again, because of limited econ economies of scale, it will be difficult for these 
cloud service providers to determine from an economic perspective that they are coming closer to their customers in the region. One of the main reasons why this is a challenge is because we are still looking at our region as the individual 34 islands that we are, as opposed to looking at our region as the almost 44 million people that are living there, which will change the dynamics of creating a business model to bring these cloud service providers closer to us and limiting then the latency that we would experience when taking their, our services from them, or when we're looking at um, the cost of IP um, transit when we are building infrastructure, and also making sure that all services, regardless of location, will be experienced at the best quality of service. So as much as we need to take into consideration how 5G will impact all of the islands in the Caribbean, including Curacao, I think there are some underlying aspects that we also need to look at and look at them even before these developments starts because they could be limiting factors. As we have seen, everything is in place. We have good connectivity. We have very good infrastructure on island, but the limitations are the pricing, the distance, and the quality of the IP that we are purchasing in the Caribbean. Most of the times when presentations are given, we end the presentations indicating that we have or we ask the audience for questions. Because maybe we haven't, we haven't covered all of the problems that are out there. In this particular case, What we want to do is ask everybody to think about how and what we need to do to change these dynamics in order to make sure that Curacao, and not only Curacao, but also the Caribbean, can participate to the max and get the maximum out of the value proposition that 5G is promising us. There are a lot of developments and a lot of possibilities in the digital economy, especially when we're looking at the 5G development. But there is still a lot of work to be done before Curacao can really benefit from the 5G future that is in front of us. Thank you very much.